Hello everyone, welcome to Whale and Dolphin Conservation's Dolphin Defenders Award. My name is Pamela and I'm going to be taking you through the discovery section, which is the first part of three sections that you need to complete to get your special Dolphin Defenders Award. So in discovery, you'll learn all about whales, dolphins and porpoises. And then if you complete a fundraising activity and an action, then you can achieve your Dolphin Defenders Award. So let's see what we can learn about whales and dolphins today. So if you'd like to see these slides, then just go on to the WDC website under educational resources, or if you just search in a search engine for whale and dolphin conservation, dolphin defenders, then it will come up there too. And you can download this presentation and you can get the ones associated with the fundraising and action parts as well. So when you get to open this yourself, you'll see these little icons with dolphins in a magnifying glass as you go through. And if you click on those, it will take you to videos and links and places where you can learn even more about whales and dolphins. And this page will let you jump to different sections. So if there's something you'd like to see more about again, then you can just go straight to it by following these links. So firstly, let's learn about how amazing whales and dolphins are. There's lots of different kinds of whales and dolphins and porpoises, and together all three of those, so the whales, the dolphins and the porpoises, belong to a group called the cetaceans. And they actually evolved from animals that lived on land. And we know from looking at their DNA that they actually evolved from animals that had hooves. So a little bit like modern sheep and cows, they would be in the same family as those animals. So all different animals obviously have DNA and their DNA is like a, a recipe book. It's a set of instructions on how to make their bodies. And so the more closely related two animals are, the more similar their DNA is. So by looking at that, we can work out what the relationships are between these different animals. So of course, whales, dolphins, and porpoises are each other's closest relatives, but outside of that, their closest relative is actually the hippopotamus, which of course has sort of a semi-aquatic life. So it spends some time in the water, but it can spend time on land as well. And we know that the ancestors of whales, the ones not too far back in past, would have spent some time in water and some time on land. And then eventually they evolved to spend all of their time in water. And quite recently, a new fossil whale was found, which still had hooves. So you can actually see the hooves in the fossil and it had webbed feet, a little bit like ducks, which would help it to swim around. But of course, modern whales and dolphins are absolutely perfectly adapted to living in their aquatic environment. So how many different kinds of whales and dolphins are there? Well, there's 42 different types of dolphins, only seven types of porpoises, and there are 41 types of whale. And usually they're pretty easy to tell apart, so you probably get right which of the groups the different whales and dolphins would fall into. But there is one that can be a little bit confusing, which is the orca, because the orca we obviously sometimes call a killer whale, but it's not actually a whale at all. It's in fact a type of dolphin. Now whales and dolphins, other than the orca, pretty easy to tell apart. What about dolphins and porpoises? They're a little bit more similar, but there are some differences that you can look for to help you tell them apart. So we've got a dolphin on the left-hand side here. So the dolphin has got this much bigger dorsal fin. So the dorsal fin is the fin that they have on their back and it's bigger and it's curved, whereas a porpoise just has this tiny little dorsal fin. So if you're ever out looking for porpoises and dolphins in the wild, dolphins tend to be a little bit easier to spot. For one thing, they're bigger as well, so they're easier to spot for that reason. But also when they come up to breathe, you see this bigger dorsal fin coming out the water. Whereas with the porpoise, it's quite small, so you can sometimes miss it, especially if the waters are a little bit choppy. There's also 
what we call their beak. So on the front of their face, like their nose. So the dolphin has got this longer beak, especially something like a bottlenose dolphin, like you see here. And the porpoise has more of a, a flat rounded face. So it's kind of a little stubby beak on the front there. And their teeth, if you look at them, are actually quite different as well. So a dolphin has very sharp teeth and a porpoise has more flatter teeth. So what we'll look at now is how whales and dolphins catch their food. And we can group them into different groups depending on how they catch their food. So we have the toothed species, which are on the right here, and that would include any of the whales that have teeth, like the sperm whale, and all the dolphins and all the porpoises. And on the other side, we have the baleen whales. So these are all whales and they feed very, very differently. And there's not as many of those. So there's only 14 species of baleen whales. And these tend to be the ones you think of when you think of the really big whales, including the biggest species in the whole world, not just the biggest whale, but the biggest animal, which is of course the blue whale. And the toothed species, there's actually 76 different kinds. And the toothed species hunt by echolocation. So they send out signals which then bounce back and they can listen out for where their prey is. So things like fish and squid and octopuses. Whereas the baleen whales, although they're so huge, the food that they eat is actually really, really tiny. They like to eat tiny little fish or krill, which are a type of shrimp. And they can eat millions of them every single day. And the way they do that is they have Berlin, that's what they're named after. And it looks like this, this is a picture of Berlin, and it's made from keratin, which is the same thing, makes our hair and our fingernails. And it hangs down like these big plates in their mouth so that they can open their mouth up wide. And then this Berlin can act like a sieve so that if they're swimming through a big school of fish or krill, then they're all gonna get trapped onto these little hair-like bristly things called the Berlin. And then they can just lick it up and eat it. So if you want to see some more about this, you can, when you go into this file, you can click on these different little magnifying glasses and it will take you to some videos because baleen whales don't just always swim around with their mouths open, eating all the little shrimp and the little fish that they come across. They have some pretty clever strategies for catching their food. So the top video is of a blue whale lunge feeding, which is where they swim really far down. They get underneath their prey so say a big, big group of krill, and they swim up through it with their mouth wide open. And like this picture on the slide here, just close their mouth once they reach the surface to gobble them all up. The next one is of humpback whales bubble netting, which is a really clever thing they do working together, which is something lots and lots of whales and dolphins do. They like to work together and cooperate with each other. So the humpback whales can blow bubbles to make a net to trap the fish so the bubbles stop the fish from being able to swim through and escape. So they blow all these bubbles around the shore of fish and then that means that the humpback whales can eat them all up. And then another one is skim feeding, which is something that right whales do. So where they swim along the surface of the water with their mouth wide open, eating everything that's on the top. And right whales like to eat little animals called zooplankton. And the zooplankton feed on phytoplankton and phytoplankton photosynthesize. So it's the same thing that plants do. So they use the sunlight to make their own food using carbon dioxide, but they need sunlight. So that's why they have to live at the surface. And because the zooplankton eat the phytoplankton, they are often at the surface as well. So it's a pretty good place for the white whale to come along and eat all that. Uh, toothed whales, like I said before, a very different strategy. So they're not eating tiny little things. They're eating bigger prey, like bigger fish and squid and octopuses using echolocation, which is like sonar. So sending out these noises, and I'm sure you've heard before, those like clicks and whistles that dolphins make. And then once that hits their prey, it bounces back and they hear that like an echo. So like when you shout your name really loud in a big old empty room, and you can hear it echoing back. And so they can listen for those sounds 
and then they know which direction to swim in to find their food, which can be very useful if they're hunting down in the depths of the ocean where it's quite dark or if the water is quite murky. Now, all whales and dolphins are very sociable. So they, I've already said, they like to help each other and they work together, but they spend a lot of time each other, with each other. So their family and their friends, they live in these big groups called pods. And sometimes different pods come together and you get a super pod, which is thousands or hundreds of thousands of dolphins all together in this massive super pod swimming around and traveling together. And we know from research about whales and dolphins and porpoises that they like to play with each other. And it's especially younger dolphins that play, but just like with humans, adults do like to play too. And the youngsters especially can use that to help them develop their skills for later life. They hunt together, as we've already seen. They sing to each other. They teach each other things, which I'll show you an example of that in a bit. Really, really clever. They look after each other. They talk to each other. They help each other. They protect each other. So if there's danger, they'll all come together and work together to try and chase off whatever it is they're afraid of. And they even babysit for each other. So different females will take it in turns to look after another one's calf the mother has to go off and do something if she's very busy. Interesting thing about that is it doesn't even have to always be the same species of dolphin. So mothers of a different species have been observed babysitting the calf of another species of dolphin, which is amazing. I bet you've wondered this one. Lots of people ask this question, how do dolphins sleep? So I'm sure you know that dolphins and whales and porpoises they are mammals like us. So they have lungs, they breathe air. They're not like fishes, they don't have gills, they can't breathe underwater. So how do they sleep without drowning? They've got to keep coming up to breathe. And the answer is they don't sleep in the same way that we do. They can't shut off their brain completely and be completely unconscious because they can only breathe consciously. So what we do, if you don't think about it, don't think about it at all, not think about breathing, and you'll just be breathing anyway. It's automatic, it's an instinct. But with whales and dolphins, they can't do that because they might accidentally breathe underwater. So their breathing is a conscious thing that they do. They come up to the surface and then they decide to breathe through their blowhole. So if they fell asleep completely, that would be a problem. So their way around this is that half of their brain falls asleep and the other half of their brain stays awake to control their breathing. So what you often see is a dolphin maybe swimming very slowly along near the top of the water, or maybe floating, or if they're in very shallow water, they might even go to the seabed and just have a little lie down there. And then when they need to breathe, they'll come off and have a little breathe and then go back down. Once that half of the brain's had a sleep, it wakes up, the other half of the brain can go to sleep. And the weird thing is, when the left half of their brain is asleep, then their right eye is closed. Or is it open? I always get this confused. I wrote this down because I always get this confused. Yeah, that's right. The left half of the brain is asleep, the right eye is closed, and the other way around. Just very, very weird. But really, really cool. What I'm going to show you now are some record-breaking whales and dolphins. And if you're interested in these, if you go on the WDC website, you can learn loads more about some of the amazing records that whales and dolphins have been breaking. Of course, we've mentioned one already, the biggest animal, not just the biggest whale, and not just the biggest animal alive today, but the biggest animal that has ever lived is, of course, the blue whale. So way bigger than any of the dinosaurs. If you've got a fully grown blue whale, then it can weigh 190 tons and it can be over 30 meters long. So maybe try getting a tape measure and see if you can stretch out 30 meters in your house and you probably won't be able to because they are absolutely enormous. You can get a whole football team's worth of people standing just on their tongue. So of course, blue whales also have the biggest babies. So a newborn baby blue whale, so it's just been born, it weighs three tons, which is incredible. So carrying on with the theme, 
they also have the biggest heart. So the blue whale's heart, just its heart, weighs nearly half a ton. So it's about the size of a polar bear. And the aorta, which is the artery that comes from your heart to take the blood around your body with the oxygen that it's picked up, that is so big that you could actually crawl your way through it. Amazing. However, blue whales don't have the biggest brain out of all of the different whales. The biggest brain belongs to the sperm whale. So just its brain weighs nine kilograms. So it's a lot bigger than a human brain, but of course a sperm whale is also much, much bigger than that. It's about the size of a small dog. We also have a record breaker for the deepest diver. So lots of whales and dolphins will dive really far down, especially some of the big whales like the sperm whale. They can dive really, really deep to catch some of the animals that live further down in the water. But the record breaker is absolutely incredible. This is the Cuvier's beaked whale, and they can dive down nearly two miles. So to do that, they obviously have to hold their breath for a really, really long time. They can hold their breath for more than two hours. They also travel really long distances. So the longest migration that's been recorded is a humpback whale. And humpback whales can migrate over 9,800 kilometers. So all the way from Brazil to Madagascar. Of course, we've got to look the other way as well. So not just the biggest of everything, but what's the smallest? And the smallest is of course one of the porpoises and it's the vacata. And they grow to only one and a half meters long. Although that's about the size of some people. So it's still not tiny, tiny weeny, but it is the smallest cetacean. But sadly, there's hardly any vacuators left in the wild. There's maybe fewer than 30 of them left. And a lot of them have died because they've become trapped in fishing nets. So they're a really high priority species that WDC and lots of other people are trying to save from extinction. Here's an unusual one, the biggest teeth. And the answer to this one depends on how you look at it. So biggest tooth, so individual tooth would be the narwhal. You might have heard the nickname for the narwhal, which is the unicorn of the sea, because they have this really long horn. We might think of it as a horn. It's actually a tooth. So it's a tooth that's growing out like through their gum and then coming out really, really, really long. So it's a little bit weird, this one. Now, there's different theories as to why the narwhal needs to have this really long tusk, we tend to call it, but it is actually a tooth. And those are things to do with maybe fighting, though we don't see a huge amount of that, maybe sensing, so they can use it to sense the environment, maybe to help them find some prey. So some different research going on to try to work out exactly what this tusk is for. But a clever thing they've been observed doing with their tusk is using it to hit cod so they can actually stun them so it makes it easy for them to catch their prey. So that might be why they have such massive tusks. But if we think about all the teeth, so who's got the actual biggest teeth and got loads and loads of teeth, then it would be the sperm whale. So every single tooth it has, it's like 20 centimeters long. So a huge, huge mouthful of big teeth. Now I'm sure you know that humpback whales like to sing. They are very, very loud singers. They're not just beautiful singers, they are very loud. And you can hear a humpback whale song 2,500 kilometers away. And you can click on this little magnifying glass if you're interested to hear some humpback whale song. The really cool thing about this, so it's only the males that sing, so research tends to suggest that this is to help them attract a mate. But when they're swimming around and they're going into new areas, different populations of humpback whales have different songs. And when the male humpback whale moves into a different area, he listens to the new songs and he learns new songs and he'll actually change the way that he's singing. But again, we've got a sperm whale on here. Sperm whales are very, very cool. They break lots of records. So they don't sing. It's only really the humpback whale that's properly, properly sings the way that you think of whale song. 
but they are very loud. So just like the clicks that you might think of dolphins making, sperm whales make those kinds of noises as well. And those clicks can reach a volume of 235 decibels. So that's way louder than even something like a, a jet engine or a rock concert. It's really, really, really loud. But that's good because sperm males, whales might be really, really far apart from each other in the ocean and they've got to be able to hear each other. So that noise needs to be able to travel really, really far. The wrong way. Here's an unusual one as well, the oldest whale. So you've probably heard that whales and dolphins, they can live a really, really long time. But the record breaker goes to the bowhead whale. So they're not just the longest living whale, they are the longest living mammals. And we think that they can live to be even older than 200. They do also win some other prizes in the record breakers. They have the biggest mouth and they have the longest baleen, so those long plates in their mouth, which makes sense if they've got the biggest mouth. So if you've ever wondered who's the fastest whale, there's two possible winners for this. So either stay whales or fin whales, and they can swim up to about 34 miles per hour. So as fast as someone would drive in a car, a whale is able to swim to catch its prey, which is incredible. So they have this nickname, the fin whale has this nickname, of the greyhounds of the sea. So I've already said that whales, dolphins and porpoises are mammals, so they're like us. So we thought about the fact that they breathe air through their blowholes. Some people do get them confused with fish, but they've got some main differences between cetaceans and fish, which I'm going to show you now. So number one is they are warm-blooded. So, of course, being mammals, that's the same as us. So when you touch a mammal, so like a human or a dog or a cat, they feel warm when you touch them. Because warm-blooded animals, we keep our body temperature at the same warm level. So for a whale, about 38 degrees Celsius, which isn't that much different from us, really. Whereas a fish is cold-blooded. And cold-blooded animals, the temperature of their body changes depending on the temperature of their environment. So if you touch a fish, it will feel cold. Of course, we've already thought about this one. So they breathe air, so they have a blowhole on the top of their head. That's like their nostrils. So they can't breathe through their mouth like we can, but they can open up. There's like a muscular flap over the blowhole, so that it keeps it shut when they're underwater, so they don't accidentally want water getting in there. And then they can open that up and they can breathe in and out through their blowhole when they come to the surface. Whereas, of course, fish have gills, so they can extract oxygen directly from the water instead of from the air. There's also differences in terms of how they have their babies. So mammals give birth to live young. So a dolphin will probably have a baby, just one baby every few years, whereas most fish produce lots of eggs. So they lay loads and loads of eggs. It's called spawning, and then those eggs will hatch away from the mother. And another one you can look out for, and I have my dolphin friend here, is to do with their tails. So on a whale or a dolphin, the tail will move up and down like this when they're swimming. It allows them to swim very, very powerfully and reach them those really, really fast speeds. Whereas with a fish, and I'll see if I can show you on my dolphin, it would actually be the other way around. So when you see a shark swimming, you see the fin going side to side. So look at their tails. If the tail is moving up and down, it's a cetacean, and if it's side to side, it's a fish. So here's our main differences. Dolphins are warm-blooded and fish are cold-blooded. Dolphins breathe air, fish have gills. Dolphins have one baby at a time and they give birth to a live baby, whereas fish tend to lay lots of eggs. And whales and dolphins tail up and down, fish tail side. Now, I've got to say, I talk to lots of people about whales and dolphins, and the question I am probably asked more than any other question is this one. Who would win in a fight between a dolphin and a shark? So before I give you the answer, decide where your vote would go. Do you vote the dolphin's going to win, or do you vote the shark's going to win? Shall we find out? Actually, 
either of them could possibly win this fight, which I know it's not a proper answer, but either of them could potentially win. But the truth is, dolphins and sharks tend to stay away from each other. So they're very unlikely to get into a fight in the first place. So if a shark does attach a, attack a dolphin, then he or she is probably just gonna get a little bit bitten, a little bit of a scar and be okay. But actually, what tends to happen is if there's a shark threatening a dolphin, do you remember I said that dolphins work together and they help to protect each other? So often a lot of dolphins will come together and they will help each other to chase that shark away. So they will make the danger go away and never end up getting into the fight in the first place. I did talk about how they teach each other earlier. So if this is something that you want to look a bit more into, you can click on these little magnifying glasses when you go into this file from the website. So there's a video here about the bubble net feeding, but the one with dolphins here on the right, this is dolphins using sponges to protect their mouths and beaks from getting injured when they're foraging on the sea floor. So when dolphins are trying to hunt for creatures that are really near the sea floor, then their face is, and their beak is potentially getting hurt by all of the rocky bits and the sharp bits that are on the sea floor. So what they have learned to do is get the sponge, which is a type of animal, and they put it on their face and that protects their noses. And then they teach other dolphins how to do the same thing. It's amazing. Now, one of my favorite whale facts out of all of the whale facts is this one. That their poo is amazing. So whales and dolphins aren't just amazing on their own, which of course they are. They've got these records that they're breaking. They are incredible and in how much they work together and protect each other. But even their poo is amazing. So I'm sure you know climate change, serious problem. Whales can actually help us to fight climate change because of their poo. So if you remember those phytoplankton that I talked about, so these tiny little microscopic plants that are doing photosynthesis on the water surface. So they need the sunlight, you need sunlight for photosynthesis. And then you've got the zooplankton that are eating the phytoplankton, and then you have fish that eat the zooplankton, and then you have things like dolphins, which eat fish. So these little phytoplankton that grow on the surface where the sunlight gets through, they are the basis of the entire ocean food web. But just like the plants in your garden, they don't just need to have sunlight and carbon dioxide and water, they also need nutrients. So just like you put fertilizer on plants or farmers will put fertilizer over the crops to make them grow better, phytoplankton need nutrients too. But of course in the sea, if there's any nutrients at the top, they're just really gradually, any that don't get eaten are just gonna sink down to the bottom. So how do we get nutrients back up to the top? Well, of course, big whales dive down to the bottom of the ocean, they feed, and then they come up to the surface again because they have to breathe the air, remember they're mammals. And when they come up to the surface, they do a poo and that poo is full of nutrients which provide food for the phytoplankton. And the phytoplankton consume so much carbon dioxide that they help to reduce climate change too. Really important stuff. Now sadly, and I'm sure you know about this, a lot of whales and dolphins are endangered, so they're threatened by human activity. So endangered means that there aren't as many of them as there used to be, to the point where in the future they might become extinct if we don't change what we're doing. There is a dolphin that's already gone extinct, so the Beiji, or the Chinese river dolphin, that went extinct back in 2006, and a lot of those died because they um, got caught in fishing equipment, and also a lot of destruction of their natural habitat in the Yangtze River. But we're gonna have a look at some of the main threats that the whales and dolphins that are alive today are facing. And of course, one of them is hunting, whaling. So whaling is something that's gone on for a very long time, but now it can be extremely dangerous for whales because we have big fast ships and harpoons that can be used to kill them. And in most countries, it's illegal to hunt whales. But sadly, there are a few countries around the world that do still hunt them. And because of that, the populations of some of the biggest whales are much smaller, much, much smaller than they used to be. And one of them is the right whale, like this one on the screen. And they actually got their name because whalers called them the right whale. They're the right one to hunt because they were easy to hunt because they 
swim quite slowly and they live in areas where it's easy to get the boats to be able to catch them. So now there's actually fewer than 450 North Atlantic right whales left in the whole world. So only 450 of this entire species left in the world because of whaling. Another one is captivity. So whales and dolphins can be captured from the ocean to be kept in tanks in captivity for people to go and see them. But this is really, really bad for the whales and dolphins. It's really harmful for their health and it makes them really unwell, not just physically, but mentally, psychologically as well. Because remember, whales and dolphins live together in big groups. So they're pods, they're family and friends. They're very social. And in fact, the research suggests that the reason that whales' brains are so big is because they are social, just like the reason that our brains are so big. But when they're in captivity, they're separated from their family and friends. These individuals are all on their own. They get wounds on their skin from the water. They have no freedom. They can't hunt their prey. They remember how far wild whales travel, thousands of kilometers. And these whales just have a really, really small tank to live in. And because of all of these problems, they do actually die much younger than they would if they were in the wild. Another big threat is bycatch. So this is the word that we use when fishers are catching fish or other species for us to eat, but they accidentally catch something else as well. So it could be a porpoise with dolphin, um, or even something like a turtle. So any animal that's caught in the fishing net that isn't an animal they wanted to catch, we call that bycatch. And hundreds and thousands of whales and dolphins die this way every year. Because if they get trapped in the fishing net, because they're mammals and they have to come up to the surface to breathe, then they can't get any oxygen, and that means that they drown. So WDC is actually working to try to make fishing safer, and research has gone into technological solutions that might be able to keep dolphins away from nets, things like pingers, which make a noise which dolphins can pick up with their echolocation and it makes them not want to go near the net potentially, that can be quite successful, and things like putting LED lights on the nets so that they're easier for dolphins to see and avoid them. And lastly, there's habitat destruction. So you might not think of habitat destruction of the ocean the same way you would think of something like a tropical rainforest, but the ocean is becoming really degraded and damaged through human activity. Things like climate change, so carbon dioxide can actually dissolve in the ocean and make it more acidic, which can affect the ocean's chemistry. There's a lot of pollution in the ocean, especially plastics, as I'm sure you've seen lots of things like balloons, plastic bags, plastic bottles, and plastics don't ever biodegrade, so they never completely disappear. A plastic bottle might stay in the ocean for about 450 years, and even then it's just going to break up into smaller pieces of plastic and whales and dolphins can get tangled up in plastic, they can choke on it, they can get it stuck in their stomach so that there's nowhere for them, the food to go, so they can essentially starve to death. And when a whale or dolphin gets washed up on a beach and it's died, then often scientists will investigate what's inside its stomach and try to work out how it died. And often the stomach will be absolutely crammed full of plastic. There's also all the noise that we make in the sea, things like ships' propellers, there's all sorts of things. The overfishing of the sea, so taking too many fish, there's not enough food for whales and dolphins to eat. All of these things have an impact on their population. So if you'd like to learn some more about whales and dolphins, you can find loads more information on the Whale and Dolphin Conservation website. So there are links on here to some really fun facts profiles of different whale and dolphin species, and a little bit more about the work that WDC is doing to try to save all of these species from extinction and make sure that they are living safe, happy, and free lives out in the ocean or in the river if they're a river dolphin. So you've learned all about whales and dolphins now through Dolphin Defenders Discovery. So to complete this part of your Dolphin Defenders Award, all you need to do now is complete a quiz and a challenge, and then get an adult to send those to us at education at whales.org. So the quiz is just down here, so you'll be able to access this when you download this file from the website. 
So just answer these questions. All of the answers are in the presentation. And then there is one of these challenges for you to complete. So you can choose which one you do and then take a photo because we would love to see the work that you've done. So you could paint, draw or make a collage of a threatened or endangered whale or dolphin. You can write a story for young children about whales and dolphins. You could create a game about whales and dolphins. You could design a way that we could remove litter from the sea or stop it from getting there in the first place to help keep whales and dolphins safe. You could come up with a design for a safe fishing net. So I've already mentioned adding things like lights and sounds that can scare the dolphins away. I wonder if you can think of something else. Or you could design a poster to show habitats that are good for whales and dolphins and habitats that are maybe affected by human activity and not so good for whales and dolphins. And then take photos of those, get an adult to send them to us, and that will be the discovery part of your Dolphin Defenders Award complete. And all you'll need to do is complete a fundraising challenge and an action, and you will get your Dolphin Defenders Award. So good luck, everyone. If you have any questions, please do get in touch with WDC on Facebook or Twitter by emailing education at wales.org. Bye.